Letter 31 On Siren Songs Now I recognise my Lucilius. He is beginning to reveal the character which he gave promise. Follow up the impulse which prompted you to make for all that is best, treading under your feet that which is approved by the crowd. I would not have you greater or better than you planned, for in your case the mere foundations have covered a large extent of ground. Only finish all that you have laid out, and take in hand the plans which you have had in mind. In short, you will be a wise man if you stop up your ears. Nor is it enough to close them with wax. You need a denser stopple than that which they say Ulysses used for his comrades. The song which he feared was alluring, but came not from every side. The song, however, which you have to fear... Echoes round you not from a single headland, but from every quarter of the world. Sail, therefore, not past one region which you mistrust because of its treacherous delights, but past every city. Be deaf to those who love you most of all. They pray for bad things with good intentions. And, if you would be happy, entreat the gods that none of their fond desires for you may be brought to pass. What they wish to have heaped upon you are not really good things. There is only one good, the cause and the support of a happy life. Trust in oneself. But this cannot be attained unless one has learned to despise toil and to reckon it among the things which are neither good nor bad. For it is not possible that a single thing should be bad at one time and good at another, at times light and to be endured, and at times a cause for dread. Work is not good. Then what is good? I say the scorning of work. That is why I should rebuke men who toil with no purpose. But when, on the other hand, a man is struggling towards honourable things, in proportion as he applies himself more and more, and allows himself less and less to be beaten or to halt, I shall recommend his conduct and shout my encouragement, saying, By so much you are better, rise, draw a fresh breath, and surmount that hill, if possible, in a single spurt. Work is the sustenance of noble minds. There is, then, no reason why, in accordance with that old vow of your parents, you should pick and choose what fortune you wish should fall to your lot, or what you should pray for. Besides, It is base for a man who has already travelled the whole round of highest honours to be still importuning the gods. What needs are there of vows? Make yourself happy through your own efforts. You can do this if once you comprehend that whatever is blended with virtue is good and that whatever is joined with vice is bad. Just as nothing gleams as if it had no light blended with it and nothing is black unless it contains darkness or draws to itself something of dimness. And as nothing is hot without the aid of fire, and nothing cold without air, so it is the association of virtue and vice that makes things honourable or base. What, then, is good? The knowledge of things. What is evil? The lack of knowledge of things. Your wise man, who is also a craftsman, will reject or choose in each case as it suits the occasion. But he does not fear which he rejects, nor does he admire that which he chooses, if only he has a stout and unconquerable soul. I forbid you to be cast down or depressed. It is not enough if you do not shrink from the work. Ask for it. But, you say, is it not trifling or superfluous work? or work that has been inspired by ignoble causes, a bad sort of work. No, no more than that which is expanded upon noble endeavours, since the very quality that endures toil and rouses itself to hard and uphill effort is the spirit which says, Why do you grow slack? It is not the part of a man to fear sweat. And besides this, in order that virtue may be perfect, there should be an even temperament and a scheme of life that is consistent with itself throughout. And this result cannot be attained without knowledge of things, and without the art which enables us to understand things human and things divine. That is the greatest good. If you seize this good, you begin to be the associate of gods, and not their suppliant. 
But how, you ask, does one attain that goal? You do not need to cross the Pennine or Granian Hills or traverse the Candavian Waste or face the Sartes or the Cilia or the Charbatus. Although you have travelled through all these places for the bribe of a petty governship, the journey for which nature has equipped you is safe and pleasant. She has given you such gifts that you may, if you do not prove false to them, rise level with God. Your money, however, will not place you on the level with God, for God has no property. Your bordered robe will not do this, for God is not clad in raiment. Nor will your reputation, nor a display of self, nor a knowledge of your name widespread throughout the world, for no one has knowledge of God. Many even hold him in low esteem and do not suffer from doing so. The throng of slaves which carries your litter along the city streets and in foreign places will not help you. For this God of whom I speak, though the highest and most powerful of beings, carries all things on his own shoulders. Neither can beauty or strength make you blessed, for none of these qualities can withstand old age. What we have to seek for then is that which does not each day pass more and more under the control of some power which cannot be withstood. And what is this? It is the soul. But the soul that is upright, good and great. What else could you call such a soul than a god dwelling as a guest in a human body? A soul like this may descend into a Roman knight just as well as into a freedman's son or a slave. For what is a Roman knight, a freedman's son, or a slave? They are mere titles, born of ambition or of wrong. One may leap into heaven from the very slums. Only rise and mould thyself to kinship with thy God. This moulding will not be done in gold or silver. An image that is to be the likeness of God cannot be fashioned of such materials. Remember that the gods, when they were kind unto men, were moulded in clay. Farewell.